Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cyclocross Social Podcast. Today we are here to discuss another week of racing in Flanders with the most important race in Flanders of the year, the Tour of Flanders. With me here to discuss that is Twan and we are also going to discuss the Dwarf door Vlaanderen race of this Wednesday. Twan, welcome. Thank you for being here again. Thanks for having me on. So, let's get straight into the Tour of Flanders because... I said it's the most important race of the year for the people in Flanders. They really live towards this race. All the news coverage will be about this. They open their 8 o'clock news with it. They open whatever news there is with it. And all the newspapers are writing about it. Everyone is talking about it. It's really something special with a lot of traditions in Flanders. And if the race comes to a village, everybody goes there. This year, I was lucky enough to also be going there together with Tom. That's why the podcast is also a bit later. We came home very late yesterday and we didn't have the energy to still record and also edit the podcast. So we're doing it now. The big news was this week already before the start of the Tour of Flanders. The arguably pre-race favorite, Wout van Aert, was out. He had COVID and was forced to sit out this one on the couch. But that left us with two new pre-race favorites, arguably, that were Van der Poel and Pogacar. But if we go into the race after the usual early breakaway, not a lot of happening. Before the second time of Quaremont and before already Bergt and Houten, there was this interesting group of riders up front. And in that group was Johnny Vermeers. Can you tell us a bit about the race situation around that time, Tom? Uh, I think we uh, had gone just over the Canariberg and then... It really appeared that the gap was quite big. Uh, it was Alex Kiers really driving that group on uh, for Mats Pedersen. And then we had some guys for the Kuning Quickstep. We had some guys for Bahrain as well. Um, and someone I'm forgetting as well. It was quite important just in the general scheme of things. Yeah, it was a really good group. And they had a really nice gap. And... Just really good indeed for Virginie Vermeers to be there. Uh, really important for uh, Obscene to not have to work behind. Because behind they weren't actually with that many. Or at least it took them quite a while to get everyone back up there. Um, so I think for Vanderpool it was quite relaxing. And then, uh, well, we got to the Oude Quaremont and Pogacar <laughs> went crazy. Um, I think Bike Exchange, UAE and Bahrain actually worked really well to limit the gap uh, in the end and by the time they got uh, to the Aurequaremont uh, Pogacar was able to bridge up with Osgrain on his view and it seemed like Van der Poel had either taken it easy or he just got blocked at the uh, bottom of the Aurequaremont uh, putting him quite far back. Yeah before we get to that second passage of the Aurequaremont let's look at the situation of that group which you just had. In that group were Johnny Vermeers, but also a very strong Ben Turner again. As you said, a lot of teams had riders there. Did you at any point think that that group might have been able to go towards the finish? Or did you think that because UEE didn't have anyone there, that this group would always be caught? No, I think uh, Mats Pedersen, Ben Turner, uh, Johnny Vermeers, like some of the better riders in that group had bought themselves basically a ticket to like the final round of Oude Quaremont and Paterberg. Uh, I thought it was a really good move. And maybe like the favorites are able to close it down eventually. But I think I, I didn't think it would come back before that time around up the Oude Quaremont, Paterberg and Koppenberg. Yeah, I always have this feeling in the recent editions of Tour of Flanders. And it also happens at the World Championships a lot. At some point like this as well with still around or just under 100 kilometers to go there's this very dangerous group that attacks and you think oh oh this can go to the end but there's always two or three teams at least that miss out and that will then set up the chase in this case two teams that did get strong results were chasing UEE and Bahrain and then there's always one or two teams that you're thinking why are you pacing joining in in this case, we saw a bit of pacing by Total, but after a crash of Turgi, that stopped. There was a bit of chasing by Bike Exchange. So it's always this tough situation, and I would agree. I think that I had expected Vermeers and Turner, but also Pedersen and maybe a strong Betiol or 
Mick van Dijken to be able to go further into the final than they eventually did. But that eventually was because of what you said, this crazy acceleration by Pogacar on the Oude Quagemond. You already said you weren't sure about what happened with Van der Poel there. Was that a, just a question or do you just not know if he was blocked, bad positioned or just didn't respond to Pogacar? Well, I imagine if he if he could have that, he would have responded to Pogacar because it's still like a crucial place, of course. I think he must like either not have the have had the position at the time, or just felt like it might just all come back together and gambled a little bit. But I think by the end he is there, like there or thereabouts. Uh, once we turn onto the big road. Um, so I assume that he got blocked and is just kind of out of position, um, which would fit the general like profile of Van der Poel <laughs> pretty well. Yeah, I think that you never let Pogacar go, you know? I mean, we clearly saw that Van der Poel was marking one guy and that was Pogacar. When Pogacar went, he would make sure to be with him. And I cannot imagine that he thought, oh, Pogacar goes, somebody else will close this. I think... It is a pretty narrow road down the Quaremont, so it absolutely makes sense that this results then in him being blocked in one way or the other. Maybe his positioning wasn't in the very best possible way done, but he was well supported by his team into that descent. And I mean, for me, it was a bit more difficult to see these smaller details because I was watching on the big screen near the finish in the fan zone. And the atmosphere there to watch was amazing. And these Belgians, they were actually supporting Van der Poel. Didn't really expect that after the news Van Aert would be out. But that was interesting to see. And as you said, they came together at the top of the Quaremont and then onto the big road. We followed over the Pater when we had the traditional Van Baarle attack. And then we came towards the Koppenberg. And the Koppenberg is really where things really, really, really started to explode going forward towards the rest of the race, right? Pogacar went quite early once again. This time Van der Poel was on his wheel. Um, and Manuels also managed to follow, which was probably like the mo- one of the more impressive things I've uh, seen all day. Um, and uh, Van der Poel, like, well, when she get to like more of like the top of the Koppenberg, I was kind of expecting him to go around and try to open up the gap, but he really took a moment and... And for me, it made me realize that Pogacar is extremely strong today. And Van der Poel, whilst very, very good, doesn't have the edge on the cobble climbs. And yeah, it was just very interesting to see. And those three eventually, like, uh, right toward Fred Wright and Dylan van Baarle. Yeah, interesting fact about Dylan van Baarle. When he was a junior, he won the cross in uh, Loonhout, the Aze cross, as a first-year junior. As a second year junior, he became eighth at the Dutch National Championship cyclocross before not doing cyclocross anymore. And very impressive ride by the Dutchman today, or I must say yesterday in the Tour of Flanders. But it was to me always clear, especially like as we followed over the other hills, that it was always going to be Van der Poel and Pogacar because it was impressive that Madhu was followed, but he was cracking a bit on the Tijenberg, but managed to hang on on the... Hotond, where they passed the Hotond course and the Kruisberg before, it was again clear that Fred Wright and Dylan van Baarle were not the freshest anymore after their earlier efforts to stay in the front. And then when we eventually came to the second time of the Quaremont, again, very impressive ride by Pogacar up there, powering to the top. Van Poel said he was on his limit and almost need to drop there. Personally, I couldn't really see that from the TV. I didn't expect him that he was in such a difficult situation on the Quaremont. Much of the Bulls, his facial expression doesn't really betray too much. I think it's more like in slightly like rider behavior. I think a good much of the pool always uh, tries to like come alongside and take over. Like once it gets like a little bit easier to pass, um, I think those are like the small things you have to look for. Yeah, but I think that that would be in a normal situation. I think this year we see a little bit of a different type of Macho van der Poel. Van der Poel that has also said, I need to race more to win and not necessarily race on pure instinct and just attack super early because I want to or because I'm cold like in the Tireno and (laughs) really start hunting for these results because he says I'm 27, 
after San Remo said he's getting old, but there's at least a five, six year window left for him, in my opinion, in which he can compete for the wins in these monuments. So plenty of opportunities, but I can also understand him that he feels like, okay, I'm at my best now. I need to start and getting in these results, getting in these wins I want, start filling up my Palmares. I can understand that. So I think that we saw a bit of a different approach by Van der Poel here this year as well because he attacked less he was mainly following Pogacar didn't try and attack anywhere didn't try anything that could be considered stupid but fun yeah I also think it's a case of Pogacar just absolutely pushing him to his limits so just in general already being limited in what he is able to do attacking wise yeah absolutely I think that that also plays a major role following that Quaremont uh push by Pogacar we saw another push by him on the Patersberg here for a couple of seconds the crowd at the finish lit up in excitement because it looked like Pogacar was getting away although I don't really know if it was excitement or just encouraging screams but there were definitely some screams around there but personally I think that Van der Poel despite saying he was in major trouble there I think the more the small gap forming was at this moment created because he was so focused or tried to choose a different trajectory that he thrifted a bit towards the right of the road and then almost went onto the grass and to correct that had to compensate losing a bit of momentum due to that and then was able to close this one or two bike lengths to Pogacar and then once he closed that two bike lengths I thought okay he's never going to drop anymore here it's going to be a sprint between these two how did you look back at that moment where Van der Poel was distanced a little bit by Pogacar? Yeah, I think he actually managed to get into the grass for like a brief second. But indeed, he lost the momentum. And for me, for me, it was really a moment of, oh God, it's happened. This is, now it's done. But then you see him close back up, which is really work hard on the bike to get it back in. And I can imagine that you have to go, like he had to go like extremely deep. But I think from that moment that he closes those meters, I'm just sitting there like, okay, okay, this is good, now we're going to a sprint, but after last year, I'm not as happy and as confident about it anymore as uh, I was before he lost to Alstrein. Yeah, I can absolutely imagine that, I had the same feeling, but if we go towards that sprint, what did you think was the main difference in how he approached it this year compared to last year when he was sprinting against Askreen, and I think the Askreen and Van Aert scenario were pretty similar. I think what he did really well this year is drop the pace. So he plays more into the acceleration, which is one of his strongest assets. Uh, whereas last year, I think maybe he was a little bit too, uh, like underestimating uh, Oskarin a little bit too much, where he thought, I can just out sprint him however I want. And he just kept the pace like uh, quite an okay level. Uh, I thought he really rolled a good sprint against Pogacar, of course, got. Um, you know, a little bit. Is it lucky? I mean, Dylan van Baarle just writes a great sprint and boxes Pogacar in, which was hilarious. Um, yeah, and just manages to convert it into a victory. I don't think it was luck. I mean, Van der Poel said he specifically did this, that this is why he slowed down so much, that they were almost surplus because he knew they were coming from behind and he knew that he needed to get these people to come i mean he said oh i only saw them pretty late but he was contradicting himself a bit he just used this as a tactic in my opinion the way that he said it in his interview like oh i only saw them late but i still knew that i needed to react or i slowed down because i wanted them to come that was in my opinion what gave it away i think he knew they were coming and either hoped pogacar would take the lead and he could come from behind or that they would come from behind but he chose that he could launch himself and because Pogacar needed to react Pogacar would be boxed in as you said what happened from the pool however Madouas pulled alongside for a brief second in which I thought oh maybe they're coming with a lot of overspeed and from the pool got Amstel Gold Race 2019 himself <laughs> didn't happen comfortably sprinted towards the victory following that even this climate activist that hopped over could not stop him it was really a fantastic thing to watch yeah, it was really impressive. Um, Dino van Baarle, the man has balls of steel, um, sitting on Maduels, getting 
like the lead out all the way up there and then actually closing out uh Pogacar to make sure that he gets the best possible result. Uh Dino van Baarle just a great rider, really has his moments and just in general great in the uh, Tour of Flanders, which we saw again this year. Um I find it like it's just unfortunate that Pogacar like basically screwed himself over and didn't even end up with a podium is definitely I think definitely the strongest rider and uh, yeah just it's just unfortunate but I haven't laughed that hard about the cycling finish since Alaphilippe in Yes Bastogne Liège no it was definitely a good watch and funny to see for once Pogacar actually not winning I think, uh, yeah, it was a very good race overall. Atmosphere for my at the finish made it a lot better. Somebody who I saw cross the line quite a bit later was Tom Pitcock. He was pretty good in Dwarsdorf Vlaanderen, but I think in Flanders it comes down to what he said earlier. The race is a bit too long for my current form because he's been sick and he doesn't really like cobbled climbs that much. Dwarsdorf Vlaanderen, a different race earlier this week. He got on the podium there in the third. I think that it was mainly the length, right, and the type of course where in Dorstof Landry you have quite some paved climbs making the difference. And that was the reason Pitcock was better there than he was in the Tour of Flanders. Yeah, and I think there's also less moments that they went full gas. Uh, I think Umbert and Houten, they made the decision. And then, of course, there was some accelerations on the paved climbs. But in general, it was more one tempo, whereas in the Tour of Flanders, we really saw multiple moments of acceleration. Dwarsdorf Vlaanderen was more constant high pace. I mean, the group up front kept working because there was pressure from behind. There were attacks, but the speed was already high. So it was not this fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. It was not the course for that. Tour Flanders is way more winding and it has a lot of these steep climbs with nasty corners before them where Dwarsdorf Vlaanderen has a bit less of these. And I think Pitcock... I don't think that Tour Flanders is not anything he can do in the future, but I think for now, especially considering his illness that he had, the form just wasn't great. But in Tour Flanders he was good, but also not good and confident enough as seen when he attacked with about 2k to go. His attack was countered by Benut, who went on to almost win the race, but Van der Poel was the only one who had anything left and also won that race. Pretty impressive because... Uh, what well, is it two three weeks ago he hadn't ridden a single race now he's won the monument and a third in another raced copy Bartoli, won a stage there and ended first in Dwarstor Vlaanderen quite the start to your season huh yeah and Dwarstor Vlaanderen I think he managed that final really well um sometimes just waiting a little bit longer to close gaps to make sure that everyone was tiring themselves out I feel I, at least that's how I looked at it eventually because uh, if you saw how he eventually closed some of those gaps, it looked like he was uh, clearly holding something back and then uh, bridging up to Beno to convert a relatively easy sprint um, because Beno isn't really known for his sprinting skills at the end of the day. But yeah, it was, it's been a great start to the season for Mathieu van der Poel. And uh, well, it uh, just gets scarier if he keeps on building form. Let's go and talk about the women's tour of Flanders then. There was for once actually an early break in that race and there was a cyclocross rider in it. The queen of the Koppenberg, Clara Homsinger, racing for the EF education team on the road. However, her cross team, the Cannondale CX World, they have pulled the pluck out of their team for next season. Which leaves the future of Clara Homsinger unclear. We don't have any rumors about where she's going, haven't picked up anything myself, but I know there is hard lobbying behind the scenes to find a place for her. Where she goes is unclear, haven't picked up a rumor about that one. However, the only thing that is floating around, but there's no source behind this, is that she might do cross for her road team, which is the AF education team. They have signed Crystal Herremans, who was the team manager at Star Casino, and there is rumor that this signing is having a correlation with Honsinger doing cross there, but there's no foundation behind this, so I am not sure what to make out of this. However, 
on the Koppenberg. Frankly enough, it was Honsinger who got dropped from the breakaway, which was caught by a couple of other riders, which eventually led us to a similar situation which we just discussed in the men's race. There was an interesting group just in the, up ahead of the road with mainly riders from strong teams, but not the leaders. One of the riders in that group was Christine Majerus, the multiple time Luxembourg champion, cross and road champion. I mean, you can't count her titles because I think it's 15 from the top of my head, but it's something ridiculous like that. Anyway, same question, Tuan. Did you think that that group would go to the finish? Because that was a bit further into the final, that that group was still up the road. Yeah, that, that one was also a very scary group. And I felt like as long as from Fluta had confidence in Sierra, uh, her teammate, which who was also in the break, then that group wouldn't have come back. But uh, Annick van Vleut kept on attacking, kept on trying to get back in there. And that's what ended up doing that breakaway in largely. Yeah, I mean, van Vleut, of course, is not used to being in a situation where she needs to deal with teammates. But it's this time different. I think she made a mistake by chasing down the leaders on the Kruisberg and Hotond. I believe that if she would have sat up there and let Trek or SD Works do the chasing because they were both in worse situations, then in my opinion there would have been a different situation where that group might have gone to the finish because I don't know if SD Works would have started chasing and if so, she would have, Van Vleuten that is, for sure made the SD Works team tired because after the Patersberg will come to later there were still four SD Works guys uh, riders in the front group not guys girls of course women that weren't up there but yeah I think it was complicated I don't know how the situation from the team car was there either don't know what really was going on there but I assume that Van Vleuten didn't either didn't have confidence in Sierra or there was just a lack of communication which is not impossible considering it was movie star but Van Vleuten attacked on the Kruisberg, attacked earlier on the day as well on the Koppenberg and the Dijenberg. She attacked on the Oude Quaremont, she attacked on the Patersberg. But one thing that didn't change was Kopecky just sitting on her wheel and that was pretty insane if you ask me. I mean, we already saw it in the Strade Bianchi where she did it. But here again, hill after hill, just biting in that wheel of Van Vleuten, not giving a single centimeter to Van Vleuten. It's probably one of the most impressive things I've seen because there are not many riders who are able to do that. Yeah, I think it's absolutely incredible what she was able to do. It's more of a role I would think uh, we would see Demi Vollering in. But she has been executing it to absolute perfection this season. And on me from Vleut, I don't think is quite as good as she was previous year, but maybe... Um, it is just Kopecky making her look a little bit less good, but just not being able to get away. Absolutely insane what she's able to do. And she gives so much uh, of a tactical advantage to SD Works by being able to do that, that they, it's just hard for them to lose the race. Absolutely, because Kopecky, of course, is still a very rapid sprinter. It's kind of like Prime Foss in a way. Although I don't want to compare between generations or riders or whatsoever, but it just reminded me kind of of that. Just a very strong puncher who also has a very good kick at the end in the sprint, who is then almost impossible to beat. And especially considering the strength of the SD Works team, because after the Patersberg we had the three leaders, Kopecky, with her teammate Reusser and Van Vleuten. They were caught, mainly because also Black was working in the chase. Black came back, Black attacked, and I think that was one of the only moments it looked a bit dodgy if Kopecky would be able to win because her teammate was up ahead, but Van Vleuten had the cards to play, she reacted, closed the gap, and from there on Black just worked for Kopecky, and Kopecky went on to win that sprint quite comfortably, so I think it was a very well-deserved win, and certainly something the Belgian cycling, especially the women's cycling, could use. Yeah, it's definitely nice to see. Uh, I think it's the second time they win the Tour of Flanders uh, with a Belgian in the women's category, so that's a huge step. And uh, Lotte Kopecky is really a superstar at this point in women's cycling. Of course, uh, joining such a strong team where they do actually have so many people to play out in the final 
it helps. It helps a lot, of course. Uh, I mean, previous years she would have been battling against all of them, uh, which is why there probably were a few lesser results. But uh, yeah, it's just Kopecky, an amazing rider, and uh, nothing much more to say. Yeah, it is indeed the second time there's a Belgian woman winning the Tour of Flanders, but women's cycling is now in a different position. It was when it was the previous thing, I think, time. It was, I think, 10 years ago, the first time they went to the new course, but I could be wrong with that. I'm just saying this from the top of my head, but the women's news was actually in front of the men's news on the website of Head Newsblot, which is one of the biggest Belgian newspapers. If I look at the viewing figures... 1.2 million uh, viewers for the men's race, almost yeah, just over 750,000 for the women. Still a pretty big gap, but it's closing. I don't know the exact share of these numbers due to what, like what, what is it? Is this the peak? I, don't, I think it's the average, not the peak. And the average of the men's race was, of course, lower due to it being a very long broadcast from start to finish. Nevertheless. I feel like the situation of women's cycling is slowly improving in Belgium. It gets a bit better every year. Unfortunately, at the finish, still about half of the people left after the men's race. But a positive thing was, there were a lot of girls and young women around there. And they came for Kopecky. They didn't come for Van der Poel or whoever. No, they came there because they wanted to see Kopecky winning the Tour of Flanders. Or at least trying to win the Tour of Flanders. It happened. The screams around the finish were even louder than they were when Van der Poel won, despite there being less people. So I think that that was a very good indication there. And it kind of fits the situation in Belgium. There's many women and girls who are interested in cycling, ride their bikes. However, in terms of racing, the riders who have a license, that amount is low. But that's something that's being worked on. And I hope it will have its effect. Because I think that Lotto Kopecky definitely ha is having that effect. To pull people towards the race and start riding themselves. Let's then go and discuss some other riders. Behind Kopecky there was a group sprinting for the remaining places in the top 10. And behind that there was a bigger peloton. In that peloton two cross riders. Persico and Castellan both continuing their string of decent results. Persico sprinting to 11th, Castellan not sprinting and ending 25th in the Tour of Flanders. Think for both riders, it's maybe not necessarily the result they'd hoped for, but that that is also down due to this weird situation with half of the riders in ending in the top 10 being these riders from this group that we discussed earlier from which Majerus was in. But I think both riders can be satisfied with the form they've shown and maybe not necessarily the result, but overall the performance. I think uh, they both should be very happy with that performance, just building on their steady flow of results, uh, really making Cyclocross look good as well in the women's side of things. Definitely agree. Somebody who was also in that group was Mariana Foss, the Cyclocross world champion. Not a great race by her. She ended, I think, 20th or something around that in that r group. I don't think she really sprinted from what I saw, but what's on with Foss? Because last year she was super strong on the road, but this year, so far, it's not as great. Is this peaking a bit differently due to having this cross peak? Is it that the level has gone up or Foss just declined a bit? Or what do you think is behind this? I don't think we have seen Foss on the greatest form here in the Tour of Flanders. Um... It's just very different already to what we saw in Gent Wevenkom, where it's just very solid. And yeah, it's just not what you want to see from it. Could still be a bad day, of course. But I think that Foss this season has one main goal, and that is the Women's Tour de France. The Tour de France Femmes avec Swift, which is being held after the Men's Tour de France. So I think Foss is really targeting that and... Maybe also targeting the world, wanting to still claim another world title. Wouldn't look too much behind that. If we come to another disappointment, that was the team of Trek. Lucinda Brandt, the runner-up of the Cyclocross Worlds, was racing. But unlike in Dwarf of Flandre, she didn't really look impressive. She got dropped on the Koppenberg and before that she didn't really mark the race a lot. Yeah, it was really unfortunate. Uh, I think after Dwarf of Vlaanderen, we saw a good brand and we were kind of excited for what she was able to do, uh, to see what she was able to do in Ronde and just in general that track squad, which looked very strong. Um, 
but then there's just nothing. It was just a very bad day all around for all of them. And what do you then think about the decision of Trek to not take Shirin van Anrooy, one of the riders who has arguably been the or one of the strongest on the cobalt climbs this season? Why do you think she was put at home and not racing? It's something that I simply cannot understand. Unless she's ill, like, it doesn't make sense to me. I think they are trying to keep her a bit for the Ardennes, a bit fresh, because they think that she will be even better there than on the cobalt climbs due to being pretty light and pretty small. But I don't know, they brought in Leah Thomas instead of the Shirin van Androoy. Thomas was, I think, 11th or 10th last year. Still very solid rider, but I do think that Van Androoy could have potentially made a difference here, but overall just wasn't day of trek and Dongo Borghini, who in previous years was their best climber, hasn't really been at it this season so far, so I just think an unfortunate day for the trek team. Then if we look back earlier in the week, the Warsaw of Flandre, it ended in a pretty big sprint for the women's race. One rider that stood out there in that sprint, who also does cross, was Julie de Wilde, racing for the Planatur Pura team. She ended second, despite being boxed in, squeezing through a couple of gaps, and then just second behind uh, Bastian, no, behind Consoni. Sorry, not Bastianelli, it was Consoni who took the win there. Also impressive, because this is another young Belgian who is emerging as a very yeah, talented and sprinter with a lot of potential. Yeah, I was very happily surprised to see her up there. And to actually see her put in that kind of sprint, uh, it was really good to see. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see what she can do in the rest of her career, just young. I know that cyclocross is more something that she does with road. Expect to see something like what Kopecky is doing for her in the future. But now we're talking about that Planetur Pura team, I think it's interesting to say because Kay and Ribeiro will be joining that team. Star Casino is still looking for a sponsor and their future is unclear, but I mean, Alpacin is really signing everyone. I mean, they're already on the men's side, brought in, of course, the Tormans riders, Verstringen, Viseure, Hermans and Van Kessel. Now on the women's side, they bring in Ribeiro and Kay. Half of the peloton will be riding for their soon-to-be four teams in the future. Yeah, it's truly incredible. Uh, it's just so many. They actually have so many people on their contract. Um, and some of them, I'm like wondering, like what the benefit is, just kind of making up the numbers. But um, yeah, it's just really interesting to see so many people. Yeah, it's nice that they have so many sponsors to actually give this many people a uh, steady job. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm pretty interested to see what they can do with Kay and Ribeiro. Both have been struggling a bit, but I personally think Kay is very talented. Ribeiro, talented but in a different way, more on the hard power. I don't know what they will do with Ribeiro, but I hope that they can like sort her problems that she had and that she can return a bit to the higher level she had before because it's always sad to see riders suffering like that because Ribeiro a couple of seasons ago was doing much better than she is now. Kay, of course, had a tough season with a collarbone fracture and hopefully she can... Come back. Uh, K is, by the way, not confirmed. It's a rumor from Wielerflitz, and Ribeiro has already been confirmed by Planet Pura, which basically means that we will expect K to also make that move. A final thing in our contract block here Tom Pitcock has extended with Ineos. He signed a five year deal, meaning that he will race for the British team until 2027. I mean, that's quite a contract, isn't it? Yeah, getting the bag. Uh, nice to see that he is uh, on such a long-term deal. Hopefully, he gets to do everything uh, as he wants. And I think Ineos have emerged uh, with quite a strong classic squad, actually. Uh, with Narva S, Van Baarle, Pitcock, of course, and Ben Turner. And uh, some nice complimentary pieces around it as well. Yeah, definitely uh, good to see that. And I think uh, Pitcock is in his place there. This earlier story about him potentially leaving was always just an uh, agent story. Like, look, we have interest of other teams and we could be leaving and maybe we could need you need to pay more money. And probably at the end they solved this. But I think it was always clear that Pitcock was going to stay with Ineos. Didn't really expect him to go anywhere else anyway. 
Baltwan, thank you for being here to discuss the Tour of Flanders with me. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks again for joining us. And we will be back next week for sure with a mountain bike podcast as the World Cup mountain bike kicks off in Brazil and Petropolis. And then after that, maybe there will also be a road podcast, but it kind of depends on what happens in Scheldeprijs and Amstel Gold Race. But Van der Poel is doing Amstel Gold Race and Roubaix. So if he does well there, we will probably make a podcast about that as well. Thanks everyone for tuning in and listening and we will be back next week. Goodbye.